Special thanks to Herman Marshall and their handcrafted award-winning small batch whiskey for being such a great partner with Suds with Luds and our Dub Network. Welcome into a, another episode of Suds with Luds. Today, this ought to be an interesting show. Um, today, I have a very good friend of mine. I met Steve Simpson years ago when I first got to Dallas here, along with, man, I don't know, about four or five of his other South African buddies. Steve is a former wrestler, among a lot of other things. <laughs> I don't know how many of them you're going to talk about, but... Steve, welcome to Suds with Luds, my brother. How are you doing? Thanks for having me, brother. Good to see you. Are you ready to go? <coughs> I'm ready. <laughs> it, it's not. It's not. I'll well, get used to it. <laughs> listen, you you've been in in the presence of officers at times where they're asking you all these kind of questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> we we've all it's been true. there. I've been handcuffed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> my point. What is that? Not one of the scariest, most uncomfortable situations to be in. Did you have to get in the back of the car like oh, yeah. all of us? Oh yeah. 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 In America, it's okay. But in South Africa, the, so, pol the police have got a lot. Do they have a lot more power? A lot more power. So. Well, let's talk about that. You, you, born, raised, everything in South Africa. Born and raised. What town? What Johannesburg. City? It was Johannesburg. Johannesburg. South, yeah. Tell me about that. Especially, the, like, the early years. Nice. Beautiful place to have grown up. Real privileged way to grow up because... Uh, um, of apartheid if you're a white uh, South African, you were sheltered. So we were a middle-class family, but we lived like kings. It was awesome. So when you say you lived like kings, I mean, was there a lot of poverty and or was it just certain parts of the city? Has it yeah. gotten worse over the years there? Uh, it's definitely right? Right. I mean, we'll get into that. I think it, so what it is now, it wasn't when you were originally there. Oh yeah. No, it's, it's now it's just like, uh, it's unfortunately just uh, degraded towards a third world banana republic now. Um, a lot of crime is ravaging the country, corruptness and everything. But back in the day, it was a stellar country, man. I mean, if you, if you're, and I hate to say it sounds terrible, but if you were white South African, really, you looked, you looked like a king. Uh -huh. there. And you weren't aware of what's going on because the press and... Uh, when we got TV, I only got TV, was only there when I was about 14 or 15 years old. So we never even had TV. It was radio. And they just wouldn't tell you what's going on. You didn't have TV on. until you were 14, 15? Nothing. No, no in the country. Did, the whole country didn't the have any. The whole anything. country didn't have any. So are you kind of shut out from the rest of the world then? Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. You're isolated. You just knew what the government told you. And um, it was really a rough place to live, but, but nice. I mean, I had a real... I couldn't duplicate that that childhood for my kids over here. Do you get to go back? Have you been uh, back? I haven't been back in about 30 years. Like it's been a long time. And I, I keep saying to myself, I want to go back every December because it's summertime over there, but it just never happens, man. I just keep pushing it forward, keep pushing forward. So do you still have family there? Yeah, I've got some cousins, got a lot of friends, but... Uh, all, all my immediate siblings and uh, parents uh, all came to America. They all? So, yeah. And and that was way after you left? Or yeah. when did you actually leave then? I left, I think it was 80, the end of 81, 82, around, around there. Okay. I finished, uh, finished my military service. Which is compulsory. Yeah. So I want to talk about that. Can okay. you can you take me? So what age was that? Eighteen. Yeah. You finish high school in South Africa. And you have no choice. Oh, you got no choice. You can go one of two places. You go to the army, and the only exemption you can get from the army is if you choose to go to university. Okay. And that's it. And it was a pretty good system if you if you wanted to go to university, but you couldn't afford it. The army would pay for you, and you didn't ever had to pay them back. Uh, with a monetary, you'd, you'd have to pay them back at the time. So if you did a five-year course, you owe the army five years afterwards. What happens if you would only go four? You owe them four years afterwards. Okay. Yeah. So what division then? Or, or, or when, you, when you go to the military and you decide to go there, there's different divisions, correct? Correct, yeah. And so do you have 
we are drinking a little bit of Herman Marshall whiskey today. I'm trying to get rid of your nerves so we don't. <laughs> um, what? So do you get to choose the division or the route, the direction that you want to go, or are you nah. pretty much? Nah. This is where you're going. Yeah, you get a. We used to call it call-up papers. You just get a letter in the mail, and it tells you what date you have to be at the train station, and uh, where you're going, what what uh, division you're going. So you're either going to be Army, Navy, or Air Force, and then within those, you've got infantry, you've got uh, artillery, you've got all those different ones. Um, and then it went, uh, the way it happened with me is I got called up to, uh, it's called the 11 Commando, which is military intelligence. And um, I, I went down there, it was the beginning of January, which is peak summer in, in the Southern Hemisphere. And we were in a train and we had to shut all the, the shutters and everything so that no one can count how many people are going there. There were all kinds of precautions taken. And... After hours and hours, suddenly you're allowed to open the shutters and boom, you're in the army base, buddy. Welcome. Well, how long was the training? Man. I mean, is it like six months? Is it oh, no. two weeks? Oh, oh, no. Oh, the training. Yeah. No, I'm talking about just the train ride to to, to, <laughs> to the training was intense. So this yeah. is your initial introduction Yeah, this here? is just like getting from the railroad station. So they put you in a cattle yeah. truck? and 100%. I yeah. couldn't describe it better, man. Yeah. It just is. Cattle truck with chairs. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's on the way to training. Yeah, that's on the way there. But you do know what division you're going yeah, to. Yeah, you that know time. what division. And um, we had made a pact between uh, at the high school, all our buddies, because none of us got called up to the same place. So we had a pact like, okay, we're going to volunteer for something where we can all unite. So um, I got called up to military intelligence and then... Uh, we had all decided we're going to try and go to this uh, unit called uh, One Parachute Battalion. And they came around for volunteers. For It's, it's like volunteering for special forces or stuff like that. You, you can't get called up there. You have to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And um, I left uh, 11 Commandos, Military Intelligence, and I went to uh, One Parachute Battalion. And I was reunited with a whole bunch of my buddies. And that was by design. You got, I mean, yeah, that's what we did. And we didn't do it out of any kind of patriotic right. thing. We just wanted to get together and party. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> it was so stupid. <laughs> well, so what? So what did that mean then? So what was your what was your role? So you um, or your duty? You go through a, a normal infantry uh, basic training. And then once you go through the different phases of infantry training, you do a, um, an elimination course called PT course. Um, and then once you pass PT course, you go to a jumping school where they teach you how to parachute. And, um, and then from there you go combat. So what happens if, when you say you pass, what happens if you don't pass? You just get sent to a different yeah, division? Yeah, yeah. So they're not sending you home. You're going to no, no, find no, someplace no, no, with no, you. No, yeah. It's like going to Navy SEALs or some, okay. some course. Yeah. Yeah. When you tap out or, or get kicked off course, you not you don't go home. You're right. Going, so they're going to reassign you somewhere else. But. So now they, so you're basically going to go jump out of planes. Yep. And uh, a bunch of us... Uh, even 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 in the one parachute battalion, even in the, I hardly saw all the buddies that I went with. We still got all split up and everything like that. Yeah. So, um, we we uh, I didn't really see them that often. We did that um, training course, the PT training. It's a two week training course, and then the guys went on to do jumping course and stuff like that. So but when I, when you get there, are you getting like tossed right into battle? This is just the beginning of everything. No, this is one of the... It was an elite, elite uh, unit. That is, you were trained by competent military men, and it was really a good, uh, a good unit. So how That's long is the training stuff. process? So I'd say it was about six months of basic Okay, training. so basically six months, and then, yeah. then people that you're going in with are probably have real bullets or real knives yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Even in the training... You could tell when they went to train uh, 
and you're going to lose use live ammunition. Yeah. The corporals would come the the night before and they'd give you healings and stuff like that. They'd kiss your ass because they knew, oh shit, we're in front of these. So people. they're using live ammo in training. Oh yeah. Well, at the end of training. <laughs> Just to see if you should graduate? Uh-huh. Just to see if you're going to graduate? Yeah, you're doing what's called tain ops. You're doing maneuvers, different different formations and stuff like that. You're really a lot of live ammunition at that stage. But if you're competent at that stage, you can yeah. shoot you on the range for weeks and training for weeks. Yeah, but now you got people, your own people shooting at you. No, you're not shooting. Oh, so <laughs> that's, that's what, what, I, that's what I thought you meant. They're shooting back at you to no, see how no, good you are. No, 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 nothing like that. Oh, I thought that was one way to get to the different bracket or something no, like no, that. No, no, well, then tell me about your first, what would be your first action? Do you remember it? Um, at, at training? No. When oh. you're playing for real. No, nah, it was um, chaos. A lot of chaos. A lot of smoke. I remember a lot of smoke that wasn't there during training and stuff like that. Um, so the, the training's not like like normal. A lot of no, things aren't no, like the yeah, real thing. Yeah, but. Yeah, it's, yeah. A lot of chaos and screaming and shouting. And what and was your like what, what's your mission? Well, normally, I wasn't part of this, but normally the the guys that that uh, were in my my division, they were basically a stopper force. They were um, in South Africa, where the, where the border was, where the um, the conflict was. It's a lot of bush, but it's um, sand. So everything that walks leaves a track. So mm-hmm. it's very easy to track. And there's a lot of cover, but you're going to leave a track. And so they would give hardcore infantry guys would follow a spur they call the track, and they would follow this track for sometimes days. And then they would call um, this unit, our unit, one parachute, and they would drop these guys ahead of the track where their estimator was going to go. And so basically it was a stopper force, and they would uh, it would counter an uh, insurgent force that would kill the terrorists basically at the, at the, they would be corralled into towards them and that's how it went down okay so then you corral them and then what and then it was uh you have a contact and uh, take care of business and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so mission accomplished yeah how many how many do you t- how many i mean is there a uh, an average amount of of conflict that you're like are the numbers even are you got you know what i'm no, saying like it, no yeah i understand what you get yeah very very uneven um in your favor yeah in our favor and uh we were much better uh equipped trained everything like that so it wasn't exactly uh queensbury rules one yeah one. but we weren't dealing with uh, a conventional war it was a bush warfare where you're going against people that just blend into the indigenous population. So it's um, what what kind of weapons would they have? I mean, you obviously are um, well a lot armed, of right? RPGs. Oh, okay. Yeah, a lot of RPGs, Kalachnikovs, AK forty sevens. They used uh, a lot of Russian. Uh, everything was Russian. Um, Czechoslovakian landmines. They were called um, the big anti. Uh, they were yellow in color. You bury them. That's an uh, anti vehicle. And then they had uh, a lot of. Uh, Mines everywhere, anti-personnel mines. Um, I never was part of this, but when you received incoming, it was uh, Katrusha rockets that were being fired at you from them. Um, old, old ordnance from Vietnam. And the era, technology was like nowhere that. near what it is today. Oh, obviously, no, yeah, no, no, it was like nothing like today. Uh, did you ever? Were you guys ever outnumbered? That, would that ever happen, or you guys were just so prepared? And I, I never, I never witnessed outnumbering. No, yeah, no. Everything was always in our favor. I always, when when you say you sent a, there would be a group ahead of you, at the other end of the tracks, or on the other side of the tracks. No, we were the group. But are you ever worried about friendly fire? No. Nah. Because when that happens, um, they radio out those guys okay. that are corralling. They give you positions off, where, yeah, okay. and then they back off. Um, and it was never friendly. Afterwards, we'd be back at base and stuff like that. And um, it, it wasn't, uh, they hated us because they'd been chasing this. 
track for so, okay, hours so and days, and then we just what? what why them. were you taking these people out? What What was the main reason that? I mean, what was the conflict? So they were called SWAPA, which is a Southwest African People's Organization, and and basically they were conducting a a war of terror on on the population on on the civilian population what were, what were they trying to accomplish i think they were trying to get rid of it well they were trying to get rid of apartheid but they were doing it in a in a way where they were going to bomb the civilian population mm-hmm. and, and terrorize basically the civilian population and so this goes on for how many years? That's Did you ever, years. were you in the same unit, same group, your entire four or five years? No, nah, no, nah, I got kicked out of there pretty soon. When you say kicked out, was that disciplinary? Yeah. Or? <laughs> well, okay, what'd you do? So Did you I, go I, off base when you weren't supposed to go no, off base? No, 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 nothing like that. I just, one day I was just in in our little dorm, in our, in our <clears throat> call them bungalows over there, and I got a message to, uh, to report to... Uh, um, the front, this, we call it the front office. but And then when I got there, there were about five or six other guys and I just got told, pack your bags, bro, you're out of here. It's like, what the fuck? I had no idea. No reason? No, no explanation, nothing given to me. Um, I did my corporal walk past and I was, he, uh, his name was McSeveny. I was like, hey, what's going on? And he's like, uh, in Dutch he said, uh, the captain, the, uh, he told me, me. Which means you're not a team player. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they sent me. To Were you a, place. a loose cannon? Uh, well, you are now. So I fuck. Yeah, I can I mean, understand I, if you I were. Had some I, 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 nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, I don't know what it was. I just I got I got told um, I'm not a team player, and that was it. That's the only explanation I ever had. So where did they, where do you go then? They sent me to a place called Eight Sile. Which is uh, eight South African infantry in a in a godforsaken town called Uppington, which is in the middle of like the desert. Really, it's like being sent to Amarillo or something if you're in <laughs> Texas. It's just sand. You know? I hope people aren't listening to this show in Amarillo. <laughs> <laughs> and um, man, when I got when I got to uh, Eight Sar, they were so far behind that they were just in the middle of basic training. Okay. And so I had to go back into basic training with these guys. And I was like, oh, man, that's just rough. How many, year, how many years into your original unit so, when you got sent back? Oh, wow. Like two, three? No, no, no. I only, oh, we were only there for two years. So this is about seven months in. I get sent back. Maybe it was a different intake that they had. I don't know. But I had to do half of basic training and ten ops again, all that. Yeah, do it all over again. All over again. And I just I And just, knowing you, you weren't happy. No, I wasn't yeah. happy. Yeah. They thought you were a lone <laughs> soldier before. <laughs> <laughs> so um I got wind I'm Jewish and I I got wind that if you're Jewish you can apply to go to this unit that has a kosher kitchen. Okay. So I was like, shit, well, I'm going to go and try and apply that as closer to home. So what I would do is um, we had to run two comma fours and three comma twos. Cause those are um, runs that you have to do on a daily basis. Two comma four is a fast one. You have to make it a certain time. Three comma two was hard because you had full packing and Everything, everything you can carry on your back and you had to make it in a certain time. So I would run, it's halfway there, halfway back. And I would run to the halfway point, I would be first one, and then I would be last back. And it started. Okay. <laughs> and then the sergeant's like, what, what's going on? I can see you can do this. What's going on? I was like, man, I've got no energy. He was like, why? I was like, well, you've got no kosher food. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm, I'm eating canned pears the whole time. <laughs> the whole time over here. So eventually they sent me to uh, the B-side in a town called Potterstrom. It's the 3rd South African Infantry Division. And uh, So now you're on your third unit. So I'm in my third unit yep. now. And from there on it was just easy sailing. It was no problem. I went, uh, I went over there and I, I had me a bunch of guys from school. And they were ready in uh, administration and 
Okay. From that point forward, it was easy for me. How long now? And how long till that ended? Which would be the end of your doing, having to do your time, correct? No, yeah. So I still had about a year, a year to push. Did you get booted out of that ever? Or did you actually make it through that one and stayed there? I stayed there until um, I had a friend that was in a. He was in Pretoria, which is right by Johannesburg, where I live. Yeah. And he was uh, he was in charge of receiving all the. Uh, um, telecommunications and everything like that, and so um, we 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 worked out a deal where the guys where I were, they'd send a, a request form that um, I'm coming to his unit, and he'd send one back like, okay, you accept yep. this little thing. little trade. So all of a sudden, my my captain over there at, at three so I got a a letter saying, hey, Simpson has to show up over here. Which was, I swear, like, it's about 30 minutes from my house. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So that was a perfect scenario so for you. That was perfect, yeah. And from there on, it was easy stadium. I was home nearly every evening. And so, that, so then when your <clears throat> commitment, mm -hmm. obligation is over with or mm -hmm. up, you can do... Can people stay in longer? Would there be? Oh yeah. That, so that that they can oh, stay yeah. if you want. Oh, that yeah. was not ever entering did. your mind, though, yeah, right? No, a lot of people did. Okay. Yeah. So then, how did you transition? As we get into what became your, as a professional wrestler, how, how did you, where was that step? How did that get there? Or were, was this? Did you were, did you wrestle in school and all this other stuff? What kind of mm -hmm. athlete were you prior to any of this? I played rugby. I did boxing, but boxing wasn't a school sport. So I did it on okay. a club level. Nothing on the street uh, level. <laughs> nothing. Uh, nothing big. Um, but my dad was a uh, wrestling promoter in South okay. Africa. Yeah. And so, growing up all all my life, we had American uh, wrestlers and wrestlers from Europe and Australia coming over. So. I've been exposed to wrestling from an early age. The wrestlers, not wrestlers. Was your dad teaching you along yeah, the way? Yeah, a little bit, yeah, but, you know, nothing nothing to where it was like uh, uh, amateur wrestling. Or, or so then how did, you, how did you go, because it was like 86, was, your, was that when you got started in wrestling? No, or it was, was earlier it than that. 81 maybe. Yeah, it was like 82-ish, 82 83-ish. Okay, so, so what was your yeah. first match? I came to America. Okay, we have to back up. Did you come? Did you come to America, by the way, by yourself? Yeah. Okay. That's a story I'll tell you. How, how did how did that come okay, about? So that came about where I got into a real bad street fight in South Africa, and um, got charged with attempted murder, um, and then they downgraded it to. Uh, assault, they called it assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. So we went to court, and um, when you go to court, um, you all, however the docket is, you go, it's because I'm in jail at the time. Uh -huh. And like, this is case number one, number two, number three, number four, that's how you line up. And then you go into the bench, and then they'll do the first. The do you have representation, or is there no such thing? Oh, yeah, no, you got representation. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty. Uh, British you know, magistrates yeah. and all that. Anyway, the guy that went before me, he was accused of stealing a, a car radio, a black man, and um, he flat out denied it. But they had bust him with fingerprints. It was irrefutable, you know what I'm saying? But uh, he just flat out denied it. It wasn't me. And the judge lost it over. Judge's name was Magistrate Barlow. I'll never forget. He said, uh, "You called the guy Bubba." I'll never forget that even. He was like, "Listen, Bubba, <laughs> this is science. Your fingerprints are on the radio. Your fingerprints are on the dashboard of the car. Only you have these fingerprints. Mm -hmm. No one else in the world has these fingerprints." And he was just like, "It wasn't me." And the judge had it with him. He found him guilty. Gave him. Let's listen to this. Stealing a car radio. Gave him 11 years. For stealing a car radio. Stealing a, st stealing a car radio. Now, obviously, he had a, a long record if they've got his prints on file, but 11 years. 
and I'm next. And you're paying attention to this. Oh, yeah. I'm next, and I'll get found guilty. And I'm in a much more serious crime. But because I've got good representation and everything, my lawyer says that they don't pass sentence until you come back the next day and you come back with uh, members of the community or principal, your teachers. Your People brother. that can vouch yeah, for you. Yeah, He's a good kid. Yep. He's not always like this. How old are you at the time? I uh, must be close on 18, 19. Around 20 is? 19, 20. Okay. 19, 20 years old. So um, they, they, they come back and um, they say, okay, you found guilty, but you're not going to, we're only going to pass sentence, I think it was uh, after, after this, uh, we hear from all these people. Mm -hmm. So that night my dad's telling me, I, I don't like this guy. That guy gave 11 years and he doesn't like you. He, oh, but that's another thing. When he said uh, we were accused number one, two, and three, and he said, uh, uh, you, accused number one, you, sir, are an outright liar. That's what he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> so um, gosh, I'm losing my train of thought here, guys. He, uh, he went on to, uh, to give us a, a couple days, and then you're supposed to go back. Anyway, that night my dad is telling me that he doesn't like it. And my mother worked security for Israeli airlines and um, that was it in a matter of hours my dad made the decision that I want you out of here you need to go to Israel and that was it and I went without a passport I went uh, with all these uh, Israelis that my mother knew they put me on Elal I went through uh, a different part of passport control with all the air stewardesses and pilots I sat in the jump seat I landed in Tel Aviv that night, um, no passport, but they just pushed me straight through. I went into Tel Aviv, and then my dad sent me a passport, and I flew from there to America. So that's how I got here. Not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now you get there. Do you, I mean, who do you know here, or in America? I only knew one guy. Um, his name was Bobby Jaggers. He was a, a wrestler. He lived in San Antonio at the time. And he had been in South Africa to wrestle a few times. And uh, I, uh, he always said, look, if you ever come to South Africa, if you come to America, I mean, come see me and we'll hook up. And So that's where I went and I made my way to him. So that's where the, your career started? Yeah. Uh, it just started by mistake. We would just work out at the gym together and everything. And I went to the wrestling matches with them and... Then one day someone didn't show up and they were like, strap up. How, how much training did you have before your first real match? I mean, were you still raw? Very raw. Okay. Yeah, and I just got thrown into the deep end, you know. They put a mask on me. Yeah. And um, did, did they give you a name or was it just Steve Simpson? Uh, yeah, it was whoever didn't show up on the card. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, your whole career, you never, you had never had a stage name or whatever no, it's called. No, Steve Simpson. Okay. Yeah. So how now this is where because I was <clears throat> I bought wrestling to the nines yeah. for real for until I was in Montreal. Yeah. And um I remember when I was in Montreal, the WWF or WWE at the time, what it may have been in the eighty five, whatever it was, and I jumped up onto the ring. And I'm like like, this is like a trampoline in here. Like, you know, and, and I didn't know anything about yeah, it. And then, yeah. so then I run into Hawk and Animal, the Road Warriors. Yeah. And we're kind of from the same area and became friends with those guys at the time. And uh, then I started going, okay. And, and there's people that are spending their paychecks at these events because they are for real. So I guess I'm always curious about when you, when you start to get, when you get into the business, and it's it's a and I, the the right words not to you is choreographed, but no. but do you guys before you start wrestling or then when you first got started do, did you kind of train together? Did you go through the routines and things like that together? Yeah. Because it seems like if you don't, there's some moves that could be fairly dangerous at the time. Yeah, it was basic. Um, look, first of all, they're going to teach you how to fall because you 
there's only so much, you know, that, I mean, falling is falling. Yeah. So you have to tuck your chin and breathe out. Or then once you know how to fall on that ring, I mean, the average guy will knock it, so it's going to knock the wind right out of you, you know. But um, once you know how to fall and, and grapple, you know the basics, and you just basically you listen to the guys that have been there longer than you, and they'll walk you through it, you know. Prior or during? During. 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 So yeah. you guys are actually kind so, of. So, yeah, so you'll okay. know, like, at the end, like, listen, no, it's, it's Steve, you're going to go against Lodge tonight. It's about a 10-minute match. We've really got big plans for him, so make him look good. You know? Yeah. So, and that's, that's basically what you're told prior. Okay. You know? But those 10 minutes in the ring, it's just me and you, you know. Now, is your dad your manager? Or no, no, he wasn't in the ring. Not there. No. And you're here alone, right? Yeah, all alone. Well, when did Sean, your brother, didn't you and your brother end up as a tag team yeah, at some yeah, point? Yeah, that's like... Whew. So you got four or five years under your ten belt. Ten years down. Ten years road. under your yeah, belt. Well, that, yeah, way down when, before my brothers came, yeah. So, and the, uh, the one thing I'm wondering about, because, again, we're, we're talking, and I, I, it would be, it's not the same, but it'd be similar yeah. when we played at a certain time in our careers and looking at the careers of the guys today. Yeah. And the travel and the money and all that other kind of stuff yeah. is totally different. How did you, were you in Texas the whole time or were you all over or did you fly or drive to different places? Yeah, it's, um, well, first of all, what's the major difference between now and then is every state or s two states had a territory. There were a lot of territories, they called them, where they were independent promoters. Okay. Um, so if you run your course in Texas and you've done your thing here, then you could always go to Tennessee or you could go up to Portland, Oregon, or you could go on your own. Or do you have to have yeah. somebody that actually? No, you could gets go up there. I would just call the promoter and say, "Hey, listen, you know, I want a little break from Texas." And are there you know. scouts, so to speak, that are watching the way that you wrestle and say, "Yeah, hey. yeah," they would have guys that that um, would watch and like, "Hey, man, you know, we should get hold of this guy." Okay. He could Good draw card, make us some good money, that kind of thing. Did that ever? Did that happen to you then? Yeah, it happened to me. It happened to me a few times, and and uh, it happened to me with. Uh, I, I think the biggest mistake I made in that game is when I turned Vince Vince McMahon down. He he sent. Um, I wrestled in Puerto Rico with a guy named Pedro Morales, who was the world champion before that uh, mm -hmm. for for Vince McMahon. WWF it was in those. So days. was McMahon a wrestler at the time? No. Nah. Okay, so he was, he was in the getting to the promoting. Yeah, yeah. The beginning maybe of when he started or he had been a promoter at the time for a while. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I know his daddy was still alive and his dad was in the promotion, but then I think he passed it down to Vince. Okay. And um, I got a... I got a uh, a call one night from Pedro Morales and he said to me, uh, hey, Vince wants you. Hey, let me go back. But that, that day, I had just been given the six-man tag team champion in, in uh, Texas. We wrestled at Texas Stadium and um, Kevin Von Erich. Uh, it was supposed to be Kevin, Kerry, and Lance Von Erich versus the Freebirds. Kevin Von Eric showed up and I don't know he hurt his leg. Or you you eventually became really good friends with these guys, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And by now I've been wrestling with the same crew for like okay. seven eight years. Okay. So anyway, cut a long story short, Kevin wasn't in any shape to fight that day to, to wrestle, so they put me in, and they gave me the six man tag. And when I got back to the dressing room, the boss Fritz Von Eric. He came and sat down next to me, and he was like, he felt a deep voice and huge hands. He put his hands up on my legs like, son, you know, we got some big plans for you. You stick with me, me, and you, and my boys. We're going to go through the roof. You're family now. This is the godfather talking. This, to is, you. A, this is the, yeah. like the, my boss is telling me. So. And then that night, Vince calls me, so I turned Vince down. Through Pedro Morales, uh -huh. it's like no, I've got big plans. They, I'm, I've just been going to get such a good push over here. But um, funny enough, it was at another wrestling match, almost a year later, where uh, what's his name? Uh, um, not Steamboat. 
Ricky Steamboat. Okay. He got, I know the name. Yeah. yeah. He got here. And um, I was sitting there getting changed, and I saw Fritz sit next to him, and it was the same freaking speech. Son. Is this guy just blowing smoke up your ass yeah, all the time? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and right there and then my life flashed between. I was like, oh, shit, man. I heard this exact same speech. Your family now yeah. got a good thing. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I freaking took that big hood line and sink him. Yeah. Damn it. Well, what was his purpose for doing that? Well, he would keep you there because he knew that the other scouts are going to try and pull you across now because they're just giving you a big push. You're looking good. So you he wanted to plans. keep you. So he he's wanted just to keep keeping the, the talent there yeah. while it suits him, and then he'd uh, toss you to the side. But did he ever? Did he ever promise you at any point that that you could be a champion or whatever it was at that time? Did they? You know, did he get to that point where stay here, stay here? Or it was just the big plans. I got big plans. Yeah, no, for it you. was good. I had a I had a really good run. I, I, they really treated me well the whole time I was here. Um, but I'm just saying. For, for me, from a career point of view, that was my big fuck up. Not not going to yeah. dance. Yeah. So if you could go back, oh, I would go back. And, I mean, this is so far back. This is before they really had uh, WrestleMania yeah. and stuff like that. This is just at the beginning where Vince was starting to syndicate his show. So okay. it was just starting to suddenly you could see um, Roddy Piper and those guys. You know, so it was just starting to get back up, and I was like, oh man, what? <coughs> See it, it that that reminds <laughs> you, you. You kind of miss the window, right? Yeah, hundred <clears throat> percent. I know. I was in. Um, I had a, a co- Hall of Famer. He's passed away since um, Al Arbor, and it was a morning skate. <clears throat> and I still to this day, I don't know what he meant by it. But he, we were stretching on the ice before practice started, and he, everybody's around in the circle around the face off dot, and he would skate around and talk to guys and talk loud enough for everybody could hear what he was saying. <clears throat> and he says, Ludwig. You should have played in the 60s. I thought to myself, and guys were laughing. I thought to myself, what the fuck do you mean by that? Like I'm too slow to play in, in the 80s? Or what did it really mean? Yeah. And, and I, I think that he what he meant was that era would be my era in a way. Yeah. And that I kind of, I missed my, I should have been then. And what you're, you know, you kind of missed where, where the kind of, when did it take off? When did it really take? Well, wait, no. Before you answer that one, yeah. So br- bring Sean in. Bring your brother into this. Like, wh- how did? Because you guys were a tag team at yeah, some point. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we um, we did great. So my brother came to visit, and he'd been uh, training with my father in South Africa because mm-hmm. my father knew what uh, Fritz was doing for me here. And then when he came across, Sean was a real pretty boy. The chicks loved it. Well, so you were a pretty boy too. He put. Do we have any pictures of Steve when he was wrestling by any chance back there that they can throw up? Okay, so go ahead, pretty boys. All right. So you get the pretty brothers now. <laughs> so we um, we started tag teaming and everything. Okay, you got Steve. You can mind. take a look at this for the for the oh, people yeah. that that aren't. They're just listening now. You need yeah. to watch this one. So your brother's on the left. You're on the right. Yeah. Now, wasn't this dude in the middle with the Undertaker? At one point? Oh, yeah, much later. He was, okay, yeah. all right. Percy Pringle. Well, you're both pretty boys. <laughs> yeah, we were both what they call baby faces. And um, we did good, man. We we had really a, they received a really great reception, packed houses, everything. But you got to keep in mind, and I would do it if I was Fritz. He's, he's got his sons. Yeah. And he's going to push his sons. Yep. So we were never that main event the whole time. You know, when we went to do the little spot shows, we were main event. But when it was like Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, so we were like bumped down the court, second second to last, you know, that kind of thing. We were like, oh, shit. Did you bite your tongue a lot? Yeah, you have to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I understood it. My dad was a promoter. You know, if I was wrestling in South Africa, I would be the equivalent of the Von Erics there. You know? So you're, with your dad being a promoter, did yeah. he ever call McMahon and say, hey, what's what's going on here? No. No? No. no, no. He was smart enough not to know, that, let's not mess with yeah, no. the Once Godfather? I, when I turned him down, that was it. But I never heard from him again. So, but, but you also went back to South Africa to, to wrestle, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. My dad had, um, oh yeah, that was beautiful days. I would go back for like three, four weeks and do a whole tour and wrestle 
okay. entire country and I would take the crew that I'd wrestled over here, different wrestlers that I clicked well with, and we would go back and, uh, and wrestle over there. But um, So was it an issue getting in and out of the country, that kind of stuff, or the, not really? The first time. The first time was an issue. I got arrested. Was I was, uh, well, do you have did you do you have a record at the time? Is it call, is no, it technically? I just I just left. I, I left in the middle of the night. I got onto that airplane. Well, when you and come back through customs, sh- don't yeah, they go? Well, no, well, I came back to customs. Not only that, but they'd advertised <laughs> Steve Simpson's going to wrestle <laughs> in the college. That didn't that didn't worry you at all. <laughs> yeah, it worried me. <laughs> well, I mean, <clears throat> so since you go from not escaping but getting out of South Africa. Yeah getting here to Texas or wherever yeah. else you are, and then going back, knowing that... Has it got, has the city and the country gotten worse at the time? No, nah, Or is it about the same? It's about the mm-hmm. same. Everything's good. But with time, everything calms down. So, right. so much time had passed since the, there's nothing... No victims, no, nothing... You know what I'm saying? Everything was calm at this point. Like, it's you just a, a name. Like, listen, so... Uh, how it happened wouldn't that been the perfect time to use an alias instead of i mean (laughs) seriously i mean did it not enter your head like dude i you know i just left the country no i had a i had a talk with my dad and he was like listen you need to come home and face this music okay Um, so they had i think my sentence had been bumped up now to uh because i'd left and everything so they sentenced me they called in abstentia and uh, i was supposed to do two years now and the other guys that, that I got uh, involved with, they had to do like a couple months. So they bumped it up to a two-year charge. Can you believe that, lads? You steal a radio. Yeah. You get you're black, you get 11 years. Yeah. Aggravated assault with intent to do grievous body harm. Found guilty a <laughs> couple months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but they bump it up, right? Yeah, they bumped it up, you know. Anyway, um, but you still want to go back, knowing that that. Yeah, my dad said, "Listen, you're not going to do that whole two. Come here. Let's get it behind us, and then we can start the rest." And, we'll and you didn't go here. bullshit. I ain't coming back no, to I do that. Be okay. I'll do a couple months. It'll be all right. You did do. No, I thought I would have to oh, do okay. a couple months. And, but when I got there, um, I wasn't home a day, day and a half, and they they came to arrest me. Um, they came to arrest me. Uh, my, my brother came and woke me up in the morning. He was like, Steve, what the heck is he up? So I woke up and I went to the front door. And there was two guys. I said, it, it was an g- investigating officer and his lieutenant. I said, come inside. Let's have some coffee. And he said, well, make three cups because we've got a guy in the garden because we know you're a runner. <laughs> so <laughs> I made three cups of coffee and I spoke to them. And they could see I had... I had uh, changed i wasn't the same the same as the same person so are these guys there kind of doing an assessment of you no these these were the investigating officers of the original crime i mean these guys had my number but they could see i changed but then lads i'd already uh married and stuff like that so they said listen come tomorrow to the police station they didn't even arrest me that day Mm -hmm. come tomorrow to police station let's square this away we'll go to the called claw you in we'll go to the jail claw you in and Knock us out, I said, no problem. So that night I spoke to my dad. And the next morning we went there to the police station, Norwood Police Station, and they took us to um, a penitentiary called Dipkloof. And uh, on the way to the penitentiary, my dad said to me, because <coughs> I'm, I'm following them now. I went with my dad in the car and I'm following them. And my dad said, listen to me, outside the penitentiary is a big... Uh, Outside the penitentiary is a big uh, a roadhouse. Uh-huh. I'll never forget. It's called Uncle Charlie's, and they had a big airplane outside and all that. So anyway, cut a long story short, my dad said, listen, when we get out of here, me and you, we're going to go in there. We're going to have a burger and a beer. We're going to talk about what happened, and we're never bringing it up again. I said, okay. So I went in, and they took me through the gate. And now you're getting... Uh, so now you're inside. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you have to claw in. You, um, you basically, I don't know what you'd call it in America. It's like uh, intake. You're getting arrested, bro. You have to yeah. go through the whole thing. Fingerprints, everything. Yeah, yeah. Shower, bend over, spread your cheeks. Shower again. with uh, They put that white powder on you for lice. Then um, all the guys that were there at the time, 
after your shower, you have to wrap a blanket around you. I'm sorry. You have to wrap a blanket around you and uh, you have to sit for 20 minutes. And uh, it's a wool blanket and that's how they see if you're allergic to wool because the guys, <laughs> they break out in hives. <laughs> They're allergic to wool and they get a separate blanket. So this is where it gets weird, lads. I'll get a... I'll get a oh, uh, it gets weirder. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I get this. Put that mic up. I want to make sure everybody hears this. Sorry. <laughs> no. I get a call. Quit punching it. <laughs> I get a call from... Uh, I know this... The Fungenstein, the, the one warden. Um, not warden. Uh, uh, officer. I don't know what you call them there. Uh, God. Okay. He walks in and he's like, some certain? I'm like, yeah. He's like, Get dressed, you have to come with me to the head warden. I'm getting another shot of Herman Marshall for the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty good. I drink beer, but what is this called? This is our this is the rye, the Texas rye, Herman Marshall. It's good stuff. Remember, you and I and Avi and a few of the other guys when oh, we, we wrote went to, Yeah, we went to that's the called distillery. Herman Marshall. We were all at the tasting. Nice. And it this is we remember we were drinking old fashioned. Yeah, they that gave night? us old fashioned, but this is Yeah. And as as a matter of fact, good time for a plug. We are gonna be there, I think, on March first. And we're gonna do uh, a live one of these events out there. So anyway, go ahead, finish with your story. Now you're getting uh, cavity searched and everything else that's going on. Enjoying so it. So now I have to put all my clothes on, get this white powder and last D last stuff off me, and uh, I I go into the warden's office and um, my dad was sitting behind the desk, and the warden, he looks like a military colonel. I mean, he's dressed up, and you can see his ranks and everything. I was like, oh, shit, what's going on? But um, he said to me, come here. And along his back wall, he had pictures, black and white photos that were framed, and um, they were all pictures of him. He was a boxer. Okay. And uh, old school boxer, like you could see in his uh, all the poses when you yeah, know yeah, yeah, like yeah. that, yeah. and it's like he's like, who's that? And like, okay, that looks like you when you were younger. And he's asking you who's that? Yeah, yeah. And I could see it's him, much younger. Yeah, I mean, guy must have boxed a long time. But anyway, cut a long story short, it's like, see this, and now there's the whole team. They're all standing there, everything. He's like, who's that? I was like, that's you, and he's like. And he said in Dutch, and he's here to He like, who's this? And I look, it's my father. They were on the same boxing team in high school. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. So we're talking there and everything. He's like, no, you're out of here. You're gone. So this was? Dude, I sat 45 minutes on a two-year sentence. I got a stamp with full amnesty given. And I walked out of there. When I walked out, all the guys still had their <laughs> fucking wool blankets on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so it truly is. It's not what you know, it's who you know. But so he was friends with your dad or yeah, had a history they were in with the your same father. Boxes, yeah. And did your you, did your dad know this? I think Did he know this ahead I, of time? I don't think he knew it ahead of time. I'd, uh, only because he took me back to that Uncle Charlie's. Yeah. And we had a burger and a beer. And he was like, let's move forward. <laughs> this is after he told him you're gone. Yeah, yeah. So and then what do you do from there? You said, okay, I'm out of here. I'm going back to the States or? Yeah, after that, I, uh, I, I never had the intention of living in South Africa again. I knew I was going to stay in it. I love this country. Man. Yeah. But then now you are you come back and you're back to wrestling here. Back to wrestling here and um, got all the, uh, got my brother here now, got yeah. the family and getting good. You only have, is, is Sean your only other brother or? No, no, I've got two other brothers. I've got a brother, Stuart, um, but he, he mostly stayed at, uh, at home with my dad in South Africa, ran the promotions and stuff there. Uh, he wrestled, but in South but they, Africa. Oh, also. okay, so there were other wrestlers. Yeah, okay. and then I've got, excuse me, I've got my, my brother, Shannon, but he was much younger than us. Okay. Um, so, he, so Sean is here now then? When you come back? Yeah. Or when is that when you guys formed or became a tag yeah, no, team? After that, okay. Then we we came back and then I started wrestling and then a few years later Sean came across and now we legally, wrestling. yeah, <laughs> wrestling and um, Vince calls me one day. He was like, "I hear you don't want to go to Japan." I was like, "Vince, I can go to Japan." He's like, "Why?" He doesn't know the history of any of this? No, no, no. 
this is just like before South Africa now. Okay. And it, Vince McMahon's talking to me, and he's, he's um, not Vince McMahon, sorry, Fritz. Excuse me. Fritz Von Erich's talking to me, and he's telling me, hey. Oh, these are the Von Erichs now. Yeah, now you're in, you're that, dialed yeah, into I'm these back guys. In, okay. I'm back in Dallas and everything like that. And he wants to send me to, uh, to Japan, and I want to do a whole tour um, of the Far East and stuff like that. And I told him I can't go. Um, I don't have a green card. And he was like, what do you mean you don't have a green card? I said, dude, I don't have a work permit. I said, I get paid cash. Yeah. Day. He was like, what do you mean you get paid cash? <laughs> 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 so he got me a green card. I swear to you, I think it was, I know it was under three weeks. Uh-huh. Again, yeah. now what you know who you know. Yeah. All right. Bam, I got this green card. And was it just a work visa? Is that, or is it, it's not well, a. Well, no. Back then, I don't think it's nearly as strict now uh, as it is now. And, and, and uh, um, But back then, it allowed you to come and go from the United States. Yeah, every uh, year, do you have to unlimited. go out and come back in kind of thing? I don't think so. No. Okay. No. <laughs> Obviously, you didn't. No, I didn't do that every <laughs> okay. year. Okay. Yeah. And then... Um, Maybe this is why you haven't been back there in 30 years. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. It's not that. And... Um, that's when everything started on a on a different uh, uh, it kind of took off from there where we'd go overseas a lot and wrestle in Japan and, mm -hmm. and I just I liked that a lot and then that was it for wrestling uh, the whole promotion over there started to dive down a little bit and started to uh, as Vince got stronger all the independence started to dwindle. So if you weren't, he, did he kind of like the mob? He pushed them out. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you know, you were like in with Vince's crew, or you were. How just old like, would you have been at that time? Gosh, like could you could you have gotten part of that group or part of the Vince McMahon? Yeah, I could era have got, I think in the beginning. So I think I could have gotten. Or were Vince you past McMahon. it by then? No, I think I could have got it, but I wouldn't have gotten the same push. Did the Von Erichs go into that or? Yeah. Carry under his wing for a little while, okay. just really as like a out of allegiance because Fritz is a, a, a promoter and so is he. Yeah, you know? but he never really gave Kerry the big push, and that was when Kerry already had his leg amputated and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it wasn't. Uh, do you do you do you wish you'd have been in this era? Maybe not this era, but that era. Do you look and go shit? I, I should have yeah. followed. I mean, when you see what... The, yeah, but, you know, I think... I mean, it's can, a circus. It's hindsight, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Loads, yeah. yeah you, you kind of kick yourself a little bit here and there, but, I mean, uh, those are one of the few things I would do different. If I had the opportunity again, I would definitely have uh, taken it, you know. And so what did you do after you got done wrestling? So before we got done wrestling, my dad had already immigrated to America by then. And he had just started up together with uh, Sean and myself. We started selling mattresses. Okay. My dad had all the same business in South Africa. So we started opening up a couple of mattress retail stores. And I'm still wrestling every night and running the store in the day. Um, did you get any promotions? Like, did... You know what I mean? As a wrestler, did you get did you get any things where you're promoting any products at the time, or especially in the mattress company? Yeah, um, we got no, not in the mattress company, but um, I did a couple commercials, yeah. small time uh, for local car dealers. All here, right? Yeah, you yeah, all okay. in the Metroplex, yeah. stuff like that. Nothing, nothing big time. Did a couple uh, Pizza Hut. Uh, um, photo shoots, not yeah. not even uh, on camera or uh, stuff like that. It was small. If any of that stuff came along, Fritz gave it to his sons. Oh, okay. So yep. You, you never got uh, the, the lion's share of that. But everybody must have known you guys around Dallas. Yeah, Dallas, it was good. Dallas, we're doing good. So we, we started Did you run with the Don Erics, like club-wise and things like that? Yeah, they were little... No, you didn't need them? Fish. You, they already knew uh, who you yeah, were? Yeah. Yeah. You've been to, you've been to, so I've, I've, I've always wondered, like, when we came here, I, I met a guy and a good friend of mine, Joe Gallant, and, you know, it was out in, technically it's in Fort Worth, but it's actually Arlington. But anyway, little bar, right? You know, Big Apple, you've been there. Yeah. And it became where 
we went. Did you, did, do you have a spot? Did you have a spot? Yeah. Is it anywhere near where the studio's right now? Yeah. <laughs> Is it still your spot? It's still my spot. Man. Is it still shuck and jive? It's still shuck and <laughs> yeah, jive. Yeah, okay. Bro. It's hard to go away from it, isn't it? <laughs> I, I can imagine that was... Uh, <clears throat> Did you make it there like three, four, five times a night a week? Oh, man. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. It got to where if, if you want to get hold of me, you call Shuck oh. and Jive. <laughs> That's what Joe would call me to go, Lens, guys are looking for you. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, why are they calling you? He goes, because you're here all the time. <clears throat> it's always nice uh, to have that. But yeah, so it, that that particular uh, venue, um, like I talk about the Big Apple all the time, yeah. some of those people are still there. You know what I mean? Do, yeah. you, do you do you frequent it much now, or do you get still get there Not once in a while? Before, but yeah, I'll go in now and again. And see yeah. the old faces and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, I don't know. It's a great so place. It always has been. A let's talk about your me. wife. Let's talk okay. about Christy. Yeah. When did you meet her? Christy, I met at Shock and Jive. Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> oh, shocker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Christy, I met at Shock and Jive. Um, she walked in. She would. I later found out she would come there every Tuesday with all her girlfriends. They would have a uh, girls' night out. Girls' night out every Tuesday. All of was Tuesdays a special night there or something like that? No, nah, no, not really. Yeah. Okay. But uh, the second I saw her, yeah. I was like, oh, wow. And she's a realtor, right? No, is she a realtor? What does yeah, she do? She is now, but yeah. Um, back then, she worked at. Uh, she was a bartender at Del Frisco's. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, she was connected in places. Yeah. Yeah. So I was really... Uh, and you've stayed here and you still... Yeah. Now, Sean doesn't have the mattress company anymore, does he? No. Mattress stores? Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. So but you've got a place by him now, right? You guys are close. You got a little summer place? Yeah. Yeah. You got a nice... In, uh, you got a nice place. Beautiful little lake house. We got the place in Plano and then... Uh, yeah. Sean, Sean found a place years ago um, on the lake. Uh -huh. We were there, and a little shack came yeah. up, you know, for sale. And I was like, "Yeah, Steve and I, and Avi and Ray, and the whole whole group, we we ride quite a bit. We got bikes, and we get out and taking a couple trips to Steve's lake place. Um, I want to ask you, like, we're we're at least hockey wise. I can't speak for other sports. Yeah. We have superstitions, and we have you know the way we. Like for me, I always put my left stuff on first. My left skate goes on, then my yeah. right, my elbow pad, blah, blah. Do you, uh, wrestlers, did yourself, do you have any superstitions at the time when you're going to a match? So was there anything that you made sure I got to do this or no. nothing? <clears throat> Never got into any of that. Not really. I know, you, I know you're big on that. I, I just, it's, it's like so if I... It's foreign to me. <clears throat> it's not, not, really? Not that, yeah. And, and I don't really think... I don't get it either. I don't get it. So it's not a hockey thing, it's just you? I don't think so, because, you know, there's other <coughs> athletes in other sports that do yeah. the same thing. I mean, if, if I would drive to a game and we'd lost the night before or a couple days earlier, or I played shitty, I would take a different route. You know, I'd take a different route to go there. I do it to this day with our, <coughs> this weekend, we were in Minnesota with our U18 team, and I'm not going this way again. We're going to drive that way. We're going to go around this way. You know, and so yeah. I, it probably means nothing. So um, anyway, so what what's what do you do now, Steve? Like what? I what? remember. Sorry to interject. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we were waiting for you at a bar, the Holy Grail. Oh yeah, <laughs> and you were that was a that there. was a bike incident. Yeah, you yeah. didn't you didn't show you didn't show me like where the hell is he? And the next thing you call is like hey, so I just came off my bike. I was like, where are you? Like right outside. <laughs> We looked outside and there's your bike <laughs> lying on its side and there's plastic and glass everywhere. And you were scraped up pretty good. Yeah. But why I'm bringing this up is because you wouldn't get in the ambulance. You were superstitious. You would oh, not, yeah, not get in. He's like, man, I just want to clean you up. And you're like, what part <laughs> of me not getting in there don't you understand? <laughs> <laughs> well, that all started because somebody yeah. kind of was trying to cross lanes, cut me off. and. Yeah. <clears throat> I kind of had to pull the pull the chute and and evacuate re like really quick. But I remember, and there's two things I remember from that was our buddy Avi yeah. was trying to put grab all the pizzas of the bike, yeah. and and the police officer were all you know, you can't touch this. This is an like accident scene uh, and all yeah. this other kind of stuff. He's like, 
no, I'm getting this shit. This is his stuff. I'm taking it. And <clears throat> as I was crossing the road, and us traffic was kind of stopped from both directions, and Avi was walking me across the road, I think it was. I can't remember all of it, but some guy got out of his car with a jersey, and he, he wanted to get it signed. <laughs> <laughs> he got blood coming down your face and down your arms. And, hey, look, and, and I said, Avi, no, I'll get it. And he goes, no, and he tried to push the guy. And I'm like, no, no, man, it's okay. So, yeah, I mean, that stuff happens. So, uh, Well, you've had an interesting... And we're st we still come out the other side, you know what I mean? We're still here, yeah, to talk about our shit, yeah. But there's not much you do different. You're, you're cool. I mean, maybe a couple little minor tweaks in here and there, but it's all good with your career. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I never, I had one real bad injury. Um, oh, I meant to, I meant to bring that up. Did you have anything serious? Yeah, one. Yeah, I don't even know how it happened, but I, I got home, went to bed that night after wrestling, woke up the next morning. And the whole right side was black. I, I couldn't see a fucking thing, nothing. And then I went to the mirror and I could see with this eye that this eye was open. And if I closed my good eye, I just had a little bit of vision up in this corner. I had a detached retina. Uh -huh. I don't know how it happened. No. No concussions? No. Oh. Psh. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, like, any any oh, effects yeah. of that? Uh you know, the whole CTE and PST, you know, all oh, that kind of... I mean, all my friends and especially my wife thinks I do. I, mean, I just feel normal. Yeah, I think it's good sometimes to have it because we can blame it on that. <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes you, you snap or something <laughs> happens. Like, well, it must be that that playing that yeah. sport. So It's got to have its effect. Like, yeah. I wrestled for uh, 15, 16 years. And most of the time it was a seven-day-a-week gig. Yeah. So it's... It's not like I had weeks or months off ever. Well, it's got I to can, take its toll. I tell you what, I can I can say it. We're different, different roads, different paths, yeah. but we're kind of cut from the same cloth because I mean we need to go and get that. Well, we are going to go get a tattoo. I mean, we we already talked about that stuff. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're not. It's not about being here for a good time or we're not here for a long time, but we're here for a good time, and we make sure we do that. Unfortunately, <laughs> every once in a while, a little bit too much. And maybe you'll probably be there on March 1st out here at Herman Marshall as we go to the tasting room again. Like Steve Simpson, I want to thank you for coming in today and taking us through old school wrestling. Yeah. Not not the stuff we see on TV now and, and all that. But it's got it's got to sometimes you got to shake your head when you see it and the dollars that these guys are making. Because I do the same thing. Yeah. I'm like, God damn it. But anyway, Steve, thank you very much for coming in. Thank um, you for having And me. I'm sure we'll... We'll pick this. We'll pick this conversation up here in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you very much, you. Uh, Steve Simpson, um, the Von Erics, the whole nine yards here, and his uh, going to jail, not going to jail, uh, and, and and other things. So, again, thank you. Thanks for another tuning in, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.